Hello, everybody. What a lovely, lovely audience I have this evening, and thank you very much for that um, very nice introduction. I'd certainly like to commend the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and Lockheed Martin Australia for this absolutely wonderful initiative, and I feel extremely privileged to be able to speak at this inaugural event and just to see so many women and gentlemen here to share on this occasion. Australia spends over $35 billion on our security posture, including defence and including a number of agencies that contribute to this nation's security. So to be able to embrace women in defence and security through this um, mechanism, through this networking event, I think it's just absolutely wonderful and hope to continue to see this, um, this network grow and to pick up on those concepts and ideas moving forward. As a woman, I believe Australia actually embraces women in the workforce. Australia recognises the value that women can bring to the workforce, to the thinking, to bring a perspective about how we need to move forward to look after this country, and particularly within the security environment, our perspective is welcome. And we in Australia have had so many wonderful policies, but importantly, we have such great choice of our career and we have such great choice to be able to pursue our dreams. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it, I think it's also important to recognise that women have been employed within the security environment in this nation for a long time. It is not new. We just need to look back to 1899, when Australia's Army Nursing Service was established, and women sailed to serve in the Boer War. And then what we need to reflect, particularly as we're looking at the centenary of World War I, how many Australian Army nurses deployed to tend to our wounded Anzacs at Gallipoli and France? Over 2,139 Army nurses deployed to look after our Anzacs. And 29 of those women, they died on active service. And sometimes we forget the women's contribution during World War I. It's important we look at World War II as well, where we had over 60,000 women join the three services here in Australia because of the shortage of males. And those 60,000 women were contributing to our national security. So I just ask you to often pause and reflect that women have been serving in a security environment, in defence or in security professions for well over 100 years for this country. But more recently, women have deployed on all military operations, from Cambodia to Rwanda to Somalia to East Timor to Bougainville to the Gulf, Solomon Islands to Iraq to Afghanistan. Women have been and continue to serve this nation. And I'd like to think that women of my generation and past generations have actually paved the way not only for us today, but for our future generations. Women have, throughout history, been inspired and they have aspired to achieve equity and to succeed. And we should be inspired by a lot of individual achievements and importantly, collective achievements that women have made. And tonight actually offers us this, offers us this opportunity to share, to learn from each other, to network, and just to reflect on those that have inspired you, but also what inspires you today. I did, as Raiden said, 31 years in the Australian Army, and I'm now on my second career in the Australian Public Service. I've served in um, the Australian Defence Force and I've served in the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, both key agencies in national security. And today I've now embarked on a career with the Department of Health because I have a dream. And I'll share that if you ask me about it later. But there is method to my journey at the moment. But let's talk about the early part of my, my journey and why I joined the Australian Army. My father was a serving officer and I grew up and my brother, both of us grew up loving the lifestyle that my parents offered us. We moved all around Australia and overseas and I never felt more proud than when my father put on his uniform and I was able to join him on a parade and just join in the life of Army. I had my family but I had Dad's broader Army family. So I remember when I was about to leave school and I said to mum and dad, I have a dream, I want to be a soldier. And my dad said, no way, that's not a life for a girl. You are not going to be a soldier. You are going to do what girls do. 
So I was the dutiful daughter and I did secretarial training. And I learned an important skill back then. I learned how to touch type. Mm, I can still do that today. And I was 18 and you'll get to do the math by the time I finished. Um, <laughs> I was 18 and my father was posted to Canberra, so I had my secretarial qualifications. I followed mum and dad to Canberra and I had my first job here with Hodgkinson Real Estate and I was a secretary and I used to do the payroll and I knew that this was not inspiring me, this is not my ambition. <laughs> Two years of that I said to mum and dad, I want to join the army, I still want to be a soldier. And so... Dad was actually quietly confident I wouldn't be accepted. I'm 156 <laughs> centimetres, five foot one and a half. Um, I'm very much the girl. Um, I was spoilt and he said, Army won't accept her in, into the ranks. But he did make me try for officer training. But I was accepted. I got a telegram, telegram in those days, <laughs> telling me I'd been accepted into officer training. And I, at the age of 20, uh, the year 1979, I marched into the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps School in Sydney. And when I did march in, Mum and Dad were quietly confident that I wouldn't pass. <laughs> it was going to be too tough. Um, well, they were wrong. I did pass, um, but they were right. It was actually a pretty tough year. Uh, 1979 was the end of a decade that we saw so much change in the army where women didn't have to leave if they were pregnant. Women didn't have to leave if they were married. The year before I joined, which was 1978, it was the first year that women were given equal pay for equal work. Uh, 1979 was the first year that women were actually um, trained by men. It was a shock for the women, but trust me, it was more of a shock for the, for the men. <laughs> Um, it was the first year that we were required to qualify on uh, military weapons and uh, it was the first year that women were required to uh, do military um, training out in the field. I know how to put up a hoochie, I know how to live in the field. It was never ever anything I really grew to love but I did it and I, um, I look back fondly of those 12 months and 33 of us marched into that school on the 22nd of February 79 and 21 of us graduated. And would you believe on the 12th of December this year, there will be 15 of us joining with each other in Tasmania to celebrate our 35th anniversary. Um, it was a wonderful training year for me. And I was so proud to march out. I must point out here, the Chief of Army was going through his training in Portsea at the same time. Um, and our course was loosely aligned, I'd like to say, with um, our colleagues going through Portsea. When I graduated as a second lieutenant, I was posted to a little town called Bandiana in Albury, Wodonga. And I was, um, the, this commanding officer really just saw females doing what females in his mind should do take minutes at meetings, make him cups of coffee, do basic administration. And when dignitaries arrived from foreign services, I was tasked to look after their wives. Sometimes there was an up, I could go shopping, but other times I actually felt, what was that training all about? 12 months of going through that and all I was doing was routine administration. But I do have to remember that at that point, only 23% of positions were actually open for women in the Australian Army in 1980. And it was not until the mid 80s where we started to see another shift. The leadership started to recognise that women were valued in the service and we integrated our training, our officer training. And we started to appoint females to, to, the, to commanding officer roles. Uh, our first female pilots graduated and then by the end of the 80s, 43% of positions were open to women. And I look back and I think when I left in 2010, 93% of positions were open to women. So throughout that journey, we saw the leadership of our organisation embrace women and see that if they could compete equally and give, given the opportunities as their male colleagues, they could achieve. And I think now we're nearing 100% where women can compete with their male colleagues in positions across the Defence Force. So we have come a long way. And I just wanted to share a little bit about my journey and some of the, the lessons I learned. Certainly for those first few years, I think I made it quite easily to the rank of major. I look back and I feel now that I wasn't inspired. 
I didn't have aspirations. I did what I had to do. I, 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 I often reflect that my leadership style was very much managerial. I really didn't understand what it meant to lead. But it was in, in 1990 where I was given a wonderful opportunity to introduce a new fleet of helicopters into the Australian Army, which was the fleet of Blackhawks. It was also at a time when the whole rotary wing capability that was in our Defence Force, which had resided with Air Force, transferred to Army. And as an Army major in an Air Force Logistics Command about to take over responsibility for logistics support to helicopters, we weren't very popular. <laughs> But I had a wonderful team of logisticians and engineers and we knew how important it was to make sure Army was prepared to take over the fleet of helicopters, but importantly, to have those Blackhawks available for a deployment, which was to Cambodia at that time. And unfortunately, our supply chain wasn't as robust as it could have been. And just about every one of those 23 Blackhawks was grounded. And so what we had to do is work double time to actually get their Blackhawks off the ground so that they could support our forces in Cambodia. I was inspired, just inspired with how people can get together. And I saw a different style in me. I recognised you can lead by embracing your team's skills and capabilities to, and if you've got a vision and you've got a goal that you want to achieve and everyone works towards that. I was inspired and I knew that this career was for me. In the late 1990s, and a second highlight, I was posted to our forces command. And it was at a time we were planning for um, our forces that were in uh, Bougainville, but also we were planning our deployment into East Timor, the first major deployment since Vietnam. And my team and I really were facing considerable challenges. We had outsourced a lot of our supply chain, a lot of our um, logistics capability. We really had very poor IT, not understanding where all our equipment was to make sure we were ready to support our forces in East Timor. But we did it. It wasn't easy, but it was the, the most rewarding um, role that I think I performed with my team, just making sure that we could support the forces in East Timor. The third and final highlight I'll share with you was when I had the privilege to be the Chief of Staff um, of the Peace Monitoring Group in Bougainville. It was a combined force of a number of nations. It was also um, a force that involved Defence Force personnel, but also public servants. And we had a key role to play in the restoration of the peace. I remember when we arrived in Bougainville and I walked through the streets with the commander and we saw how there was nothing. The whole island of Bougainville as part of Papua New Guinea had imploded. There was no infrastructure, there was no school, there was no church, there was no community. And I, I had a, a, a defined role, which was the Chief of Staff, to manage the headquarters for the commander. Our role, we were unarmed. It was a decision of the government of the day that we would go in unarmed. So we relied significantly on situational awareness because we had our forces around the island trying to monitor peace and look at the return of the weapons and to, to try and restore that community. But I learned very early in that deployment, I had an undefined role. I was a female. It's a matriarchal society. I was able to connect with the women of Bougainville and the commander and I recognised to them the importance of this peace process the importance of rebuilding their community, their education, their church, just to rebuild their island nation. And they used to talk to me. I could stand outside and talk to the women and learn and, get, and build on my situational awareness because I was a woman. And I think this is a key message for you in security and for anybody that is looking at a diverse workforce. There are different perspectives that women bring. There are different ways that we can contribute to a peace process. The recent UN resolution, 1325, talks about women in this role. And I lived it firsthand. And I think it is such an important message and lesson for you to take away. Then I came home from Bougainville. I was on such a high. And I was told my career was over. I was a Lieutenant Colonel. That was it for me. I was now um, really not employable beyond that rank. And I had reached my ceiling rank. But another door opened and that was in the, the world of corporate services in the, the Army, and I embraced that opportunity. And that's another little lesson just to always take away. 
One door will close, another one will open. And you have to follow that and pursue your dream. And I think that now, if I look back, if I hadn't have embraced that opportunity and seen it as an opportunity, I would have never had the privilege or the honour to be promoted to the rank of Major General. Because it was in that corporate services environment that I was able to compete and I was able to do the job that I did within the Australian Army. But it then set me up for my future career, which is now, I, I call, I'm trying to fast track this career in the public service. I did two years in Veterans Affairs, it's like a posting. That was a soft landing from the Army into the public service, to be frank. It was um, still within my family of defence. I am still passionate about veterans' needs, and I will go back there one day. Um, but I did two years in Veterans Affairs. I've now been in the Department of Immigration. And people talk to me about what was immigration like. It's the most incredible organisation you could ever work with. I thought Veterans Affairs was complex. I thought Defence was complex. But immigration and border protection was just amazing. It's a department that is strategic policy agency and regulator. It's a program and contract manager. It's a service deliverer. It is in national security. It's in foreign, economic and social policy. It is global, but every transaction it performs, it can touch an individual. It would have to be the most scrutinised, complex and diverse organisation in the Commonwealth. So how do you lead or be part of a leadership team with that type of complexity. When I farewelled the Secretary, I mentioned to him what I enjoyed about his leadership style and what I think is important in that type of environment is to have that steady battle rhythm, that you don't get panicked. You don't have the mood swings that you occasionally see with um, leaders. It's steady and it's the heartbeat of the organisation that people are prepared to follow and take your lead and particularly in the national security environment, particularly the challenges that immigration was facing. And now I've moved into the Department of Health and day three, I've got some more challenges, but I'm really excited and looking forward to that. So 35 years, mostly in the security environment and defence environment. I just ask you to take away three lessons for me and then I'll share the couple of challenges. One is good leadership, not about being popular. Sometimes it's about making some pretty tough decisions as a leader. It's about making sure you're being fair to everybody when you're making those decisions. And I remember a famous general once said, the day a soldier stops bringing me his problems or her problems is the day that I've stopped leading. It's that they either think that I've, I don't, um, I've got no time for them, they've lost confidence in me, or the fact is I've just simply failed as a leader. So no matter how overwhelming your job might be as a leader, you can never have your door closed. You must always be prepared to listen. The second lesson for me is about giving yourself space and time to think and time to reflect. And that's what I found in Bougainville, the opportunity just to have that think time. Because it's amazing what you can pick up. If you're working at 100 miles an hour, you overlook things. You just need to occasionally step back back and reflect and work out what is that jigsaw that's coming together so that you can actually contribute and you can make a difference. And the third lesson for me is about your core values. I've had to draw on my values on many occasions when confronted with situations, when confronted with challenges. And those core values, one of them which was always important to me was having courage. Having courage to take a chance, having courage to make a choice having courage to try something different, and also integrity. Have integrity in what you believe in. And sometimes you will be challenged, but it's understanding what gives you the strength to actually make the decisions that you need to make. The challenges for women in defence and security, we're competing, well, every employer is competing now for talent. And I think it is important that we recognise that everybody will bring a perspective when facing a challenge, when facing a task. And so therefore all employers need to be making sure that we've got the policies and we've got the training and we want to be the employer of choice so we get the best men and women into our organisation. 
because we need the diversity, particularly in the security environment. And as I mentioned that UN resolution, if you haven't read that, have a read of that, because it does recognise that women have such a critical role in peacekeeping, in um, looking after women who may be the subject of atrocities during war. Soldiers may not be exposed to them as much as women. So I'd like you just to, to be conscious of that. So in concluding, I did have a dream to be a soldier and I was a soldier for over 31 years and very proud of that. Um, I was driven to succeed, but I also took control of my destiny. I made choices that were right for me. I didn't try to be better than anybody else. I just tried to be the best I could possibly be in my endeavours. I was disciplined. Um, I got my first dose of personal discipline when I marched into the Women's Royal Australian Army Corps in 1979, and then the good dose of military dis discipline on top of that. And I still remain disciplined to this day. And finally, that balance I mentioned, the time for you. I don't like the expression work-life balance. I talk about working, what's, imp what's, what's important to you? What's important to me is my work. I love my work, but I love my PT, I love my gym, I love my husband, I love my parents, I love my cat. It's about finding and negotiating that balance in your life. And sometimes there are trade-offs. Sometimes I can be at work for longer hours, depending on what the situation is. Other times I have it with my family. So it's all about having that balance in your life and also knowing what you want, having your goal, being inspired and aspire to reach to be the best you can be. Thank you. Liz, that was just riveting. I have to say that was absolutely riveting and really quite inspiring in, in many ways. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Liz has kindly agreed to uh, take a few questions. We won't uh, keep everyone sort of standing yeah. semi at attention for, for too long, but uh, let's not lose uh, the opportunity to, to have some more words of wisdom. So any, any questions for Liz? some mentors and um, if you think that it's important to have mentors and if you know if there's a difference between having a, a senior male or female mentor and if you know you should choose one or the other in terms of furthering your own skills and abilities. To me mentoring is about connection with people and it's about having networks. I don't think women are necessarily as good at networking as men are. I'm certainly not. Um, but what I did find throughout my career that in particularly in the Australian Defence Force, there were senior leaders there who recognised early the importance of half the population of Australia and encouraging women to be part of the Defence Force. And what they were able to do was recognise that women were actually making that contribution and looking at those opportunities. And a lot of my um, direct supervisors, bosses, commanders, recognised that and would guide me and they'd, they'd help me understand what my value was. Have you heard of the imposter syndrome? A lot of women and some men actually suffer from the imposter syndrome where you think, I don't deserve to be here. What have I done to get to this level? And it was that encouragement of my supervisors to say, Liz, you deserve it. You've actually worked hard to be here. Um, don't step back from that. And it was having the courage to often step outside my comfort zone as well and my bosses and, and people that were just off to the side sort of watching my career who would challenge me. And I must admit, I was nervous to go to Bougainville. I, I'd, I'd served 20 years in the Army at that point, and I didn't think I'd be up to it. Um, but it was the mentors, it was my bosses, even my peers, saying, no, Liz, you can do that. You've been doing this for 20 years. This is what you've trained to do. Um, so it's a lot of, it's a mixture. I, I don't hang a hat on one mentor, but it's um, a lot of people that observe you and you having the courage to step outside of your comfort zone and it's having people you trust that will give you that guidance um, and having networks like this. Um, I still today use networks when I'm facing a challenge at work. It, it's invaluable. My question is about that day when you walked in in 1979 and a period of such change for Army. Uh, to those of us in the audience facing um, a threat climate of a lot of change in the security field, what would be uh, the sort of personal lessons from going through a period of change that you would share with us 
you know, beyond just the career as a, as a woman and a time of change? Um, I actually love change. Um, it it, it energises me. Um, I feel that the, the old expression, if it ain't broke, you don't fix it, to me is someone who just doesn't want to make a difference. Um, so therefore, for me, advice in any change process is to embrace it and to be part of it. Um, and it's not about always being the leader in a change process either. As I say, there's leadership, but there's also followership. And it's knowing when to lead and when to follow. Um, and some people do get nervous and it's helping your team work through that because you might be energised, you might be inspired by the change and you might be in a leadership role, but it's helping them understand how they can follow, how they can influence and be part of that. You don't want to be left behind would be what I'd say. And that's why in on that day in 1979, I was nervous, I was excited, but I knew I was part of something that was really important. And all of us, all of us that marched in, we wanted to make a difference. A few girls left within day two. Um, they just didn't really like it. Um, so, yep, that's what I'd suggest, be part of. As being in so many leaderships as you have, but leadership positions as you have been, do you see women um, in those positions having different um, traits than men in similar positions? Because a lot of women that I've seen in senior roles seem to exhibit um, a lot of male qualities and also sometimes they act like one of the boys. I'm wondering if women bring something different, if you see something in female leaders that's different from men. To always be authentic in your leadership style. And that's why values are so important to me. If you understand your values and you bring them to your leadership role. I've never tried to be a male. Um, I've never tried to adopt the, the, the leadership traits of a male, but to me, some males are not like you would classify as the um, macho warrior either, that they actually connect with their people. So it's all about the authenticity of a leader. Um, and I always step back when I see people putting on a different persona because they think they have to, or they think that's what people want to see. Um, but I've had to adapt my style as well, depending on the circumstance. I certainly had to adapt my style from being in the army to being in the public service. Um, I often say that was a bit of a, a challenge for me. Um, in the army, for example, I wore a uniform. I wore rank. I walked into a room. People didn't have to f say, who is she? Um, they knew because they saw it. Um, and then to transition into the public service, nobody really knows who you are until you establish yourself. Um, so I did have to adjust my style a little bit. Um, and I often, in other speeches when I talk about leadership, where sometimes it's had to be collaborative, sometimes it's had to be directive, um, but it's always authentic. Uh, it's always about who I am and I don't try to be somebody I'm not. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think at this point it's really just uh, for me to, uh, to thank Liz for her presentation. Before I do that, can I uh, just very quickly endorse uh, all of Raiden's comments, uh, the scripted ones and the, un the unscripted one. Uh, my sense is that you know, this is uh, an idea uh, whose time has well and truly come over time, in fact, really, uh, for an organisation such as this to provide a focus for networking and for thinking about leadership within uh, the defence and security uh, arena. Uh, and I'm very pleased that um, Aspie is going to be uh, uh, teaming with Lockheed Martin to do that over the, the coming uh, 12 months uh, uh, and, and more. Um, I want to thank uh, my team, uh, people from both organisations that really have put in a serious amount of effort over the last 12 months or so uh, to make this a reality. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone here for, for coming as well because that tells me that I think we're on to something, something rather, rather good. Um, Liz, can I, can I just uh, thank you for your own comments, which um, um, I really found quite um, inspiring in many ways. They, they actually helped me to um, understand you a little better from the time we worked together in defence um, over a, a number of fairly ugly issues. Um, uh, I can report that, uh, that Liz and I know more about the, um, the treatment of uh, kangaroos um, during a culling season <laughs> than either of us ever want to know about. Um, but the good news is that there is life beyond capture yeah. myopathy, right, and, um, and, uh, and culling, um, and, a future, uh, and a future that um, I think uh, is still uh, well before you in terms of your, your uh, transition into, uh, into the public service. Um, 
some takeaways I have from your speech is that there are, there are few things in life, frankly, more satisfying than being able to disprove your parents' low expectations yeah. <laughs> uh, of what you can achieve. I, I certainly, I certainly recognise that very, very strongly. Um, uh, and I also recognise in you many of those, those uh, qualities of uh, calmness and steadiness of leadership and, and values-based leadership, which is really the core, I think, to, uh, should be the core to, to public service success. Mm -hmm. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, can I please ask you to thank Liz for an excellent